Chapter 12 My secretive plans came in three different parts. The first, and most pressing, was finding a witness to last night's adventure in the back of the pearl. If somebody'd clobbered our Mr. Mittens and taken the kitten, I had to know who, since the fate of the kitten, his health and safety, was vital and urgent, and everything else was just twists in a mystery, ploys in a plot. It wasn't bad out. In fact, it was warmer. The sun was shining, the wind had been tamed, and most of the snow had been salted and plowed, so the streets weren't skating rinks. Islands of slush were collected at curbsides, but easy to leap, and the walk to the alley was pleasantly bracing. I got there quickly and eyeballed the scene. Nobody had bothered to plow in the alley, and giant footsteps were punched in the snow from the spot where the body had lain with the bag. Nothing remained but the giant footsteps that ended abruptly in general slush. I looked up at the windows that looked at the alley. I noted some life behind one of the drapes, and I followed its lead to the building on Bedford. The house in question was three stories high and had casement windows and vine-covered walls, and a fine-looking stoop that led up to an entry that posted a plaque at the side of the door. Dr. Abraham shrank, it announced to the reader. Therapy, counseling, ego massage. I leapt from the stoop to the ledge of a window that didn't have curtains and peered at a room. The room was as clean as a G-rated movie. A polished floor and a leather-like chase and a bentwood rocker. That and a lamp that looked like a mushroom deported from Mars. A middle-aged tabby arranged on the rocker appeared to be sleeping. I knocked at the pane. She looked up at me idly and came to the sill. Do you have an appointment? She mouthed through the window. I had to say yes or I'd never get in, so I nodded politely. She reached for the catch and then pushed the thing open. I leapt to the floor. And your name? She said. Sam. And you say you're expected? I shook my head slowly. I'm not, I said. No, I misrepresented. But, ma'am, it's a matter of... Ah, life and death? I'm afraid so. Of course. She moved back to her rocker and flicked at the chase. Have a seat, she said nicely, and watched as I sat her alert little eyes unrelentingly cheerful, her manner efficient and distantly warm. Well, you're truly in luck, she said after I'd settled. Our twelve o'clock canceled because of the snow. So how can I help you? It's more than just me, it's a kidnapped kitten, I said, plunging in. He was nabbed last night in your next door alley. I thought if you'd seen it, you might fill me in. I assume you're his father? I shook my head no. I'm a private detective. Aha. Uh -huh. I see. She looked up at me thoughtfully. Yes, indeed. I once had a patient, she rocked in her chair, who completely believed she was Sherlock Holmes. But once we examined the obvious difference, that he, of course, was a British short hair, and she, of course, was a Scottish fold, well, we straightened it out in a matter of weeks. Forgive me, madam, but... Call me doctor. I am Dr. Laura, she said. That's my name. You're an actual doctor? Of course I'm a doctor. I share the office with Dr. Shrink. I work with the children. I settle them down. I work with the seniors. 
I liven them up. And then on the weekends, I manage the Saturday evening 12 pa therapy group. 12 pa? Three cats. We get together and talk about issues. I said, Issues? She said, You know, anger management, catnip addiction, eating disorders, the usual stuff. She regarded me closely and rocked in her chair. Do I sense that you're angry? I said, Not me. A little impatient? Perhaps impatient to get to your answer. The kitten is... Ah, impatience is anger, you know, in disguise. I'd really suggest that you come to the group. We could tackle your anger, and then, while we're up, we could deal with that Sherlock delusion, too. Could we tackle the kitten, I said. Did you actually happen to see him? In fact, I did. It was just around midnight, and passingly strange. A gigantic redhead appeared in the alley and walked by the building. The Salisbury house? Where they're putting the roof up? And then suddenly, BAM! This complete piece of lumber just blew off the roof and knocked him unconscious. So that's it, I said. I pictured the lumber I had seen on the roof and the wind that had blown like a dinosaur's sneeze. I could see how it happened. I figured the evidence must have been buried in some of that snow. But then, where was the kitten? The kitten ran off. He jumped out of some luggage and ran to the left. I sighed and looked broken. That means he's lost. But he isn't, she chirped. He ran off to the left, to that bend in the alley, you know, by the pearl. And another man found him and gathered him up. He was holding a carrier. Isn't that nice? He just happened to have it. Just happened, I said. Did you see what he looked like? Oh, yes, he was quite handsome. What I saw of him most was the top of his head. He had nice dark hair with a big streak of white. Did you see where he went to? I didn't, she said. But what does it matter? The kitten is safe and the ending is happy. The problem, she said, is that you aren't happy. Perhaps it's your guilt, or a troublesome youth that's entrapped your emotions and frozen your heart, and deprived you of joy. Uh-huh. Perhaps, I said, rapidly rising. Thanks, Dr. Laura. You've been quite a help. So we'll see you next Saturday, 1245? I turned at the window and squinted. You will? To discuss your emotions, your strangled intentions, your lack of commitment. I leapt to the street. At the corner of Bedford, a voice from somewhere yelled, Excuse me, darling. I followed the voice to a parked Mercedes with Florida plates, and then lifted my eyes to the half-open window. A trio of knockouts were posed in the pain, and the odor of woman was flooding the street like the odor of fish spilling out of a can. They were white angoras, blue-eyed and slim, with those pink little noses and pink little ears. Are you talking to me? I said, half distracted, but not so distracted I didn't leap up like a fur-coated yo-yo. They nodded their heads. Can you tell us the time? said the one in the center. It's just around noon, I said, something like that. 
Is there something to do here? She drawled. Around noon? We've got hours to kill till the driver gets back and we're going bananas. We like something safe, but completely New York-y. You know what I mean? I suddenly thought about Madame Lazonga. Three little princesses. One dozen paws. You'll meet them on Sunday, she'd said, around noon. I owed her a kindness. I pay what I owe. The Gypsy Tea Room, I said. It's safe and about as New York-y as anything gets. <laughs>